I've done this presentation or some version of it for maybe five times in a row, something like that. And uh, to start off with a little bit about me and do, do, what do I know about this topic? Am I qualified to do this at all? Um, I've been a gardener for a very long time, for as long as I can remember, going back to childhood. And I'm a plant biologist primarily. I work at UMass Boston and teach various courses in general biology. And my favorite, of course, is plant biology as my specialty. And, uh, and so, so that's what I am. I'm not technically a plant pathologist. I don't have any degrees in plant pathology or plant disease. I've never even taken a single course. I'm self-educated in that area. Uh, but I'm very enthusiastic about learning about, um, as a gardener, I've been aware for many years that my plants suffered from certain diseases. Some years were worse than others. Um, and I always told myself one of these days when I'm less busy and in that golden future, I'm going to actually uh, get serious about this and try to figure out what these diseases are, because without knowing specifically what they are, if you can't diagnose them, for sure, it's hard to know what measures you might be able to take to control them. And that day finally came oh, five, six, seven years ago, something like that, on that order. Um, and that, that process was easy for me because as a biologist, I, I think I'm pretty well qualified on the plant end of things. And then I have access to laboratory facilities so I can do DNA testing and I can culture microorganisms on auger plates and peer at them through high powered microscopes and that sort of thing. So it's been a, uh, an interesting revelatory experience for me and I got all fired up about it. And I thought, well, you know, I've learned something useful here and maybe I could share that with some of you. Um, I feel a little bit guilty today. It's so beautiful outside. I feel a little bit guilty keeping people indoors to watch anything on Zoom. So maybe some of you are watching this from your phone outdoors. I hope that's the case while you're gardening. <laughs> um, and so I'll have some good news for you and, and some bad news for you. Uh, now that I have a better handle on what is in my garden. And, and again, I should also add that my focus has been almost completely restricted to what I encounter in my own garden. If you ask me, and I'm a vegetable gardener primarily, so if you want to ask me about lilac diseases or something like that, you really need to get a real plant pathologist to answer those questions. I, I will not really probably know. Uh, anyway, some good news, some bad news. Some of these pathogens are fairly easy to control, and I'll try to give you that good news where, where, it's, where it's available. Uh, some of them I've discovered, they're at least in, uh, in terms of what I'm capable of doing, what's affordable, what's, what's practical for a home gardener. Uh, there's not a lot we can do about them. We can just hope that Mother Nature sends good years our way, meaning bad years for the pathogens. So to start off, um, what kinds of organisms or what, what are the causes of plant diseases? Um, there are various causes. Uh, real plant pathologists include this category down at the bottom, the abiotic category, uh, meaning just environmental factors. Um, you know, lack of water <laughs> will cause what can be considered a disease symptoms in, in plants. I'm not going to talk about those at all. I'm going to focus 100% on the kinds of diseases that are caused by pathogens, disease agents, living things, or viruses. And out of those, uh, you know, viruses are a very serious category of plant disease. I know much less about them. I'm going to ignore that entirely and just concentrate on these three. Bacteria, fungi, and, and protists. Uh, we'll look at several different examples from each of those categories of uh, plant disease causing agents. And so um, to put this in perspective, I forgot I was gonna put a slide in here and ask you all what you thought the magnitude of plant disease is on, on global crop production, but it turns out uh, it's, it's pretty heavy. Um, you know, the best estimate, and again, you, you take global estimates of anything like this with large grains of salt, but it's a very serious uh, drain on agricultural productivity. Uh, they think something around, you know, 14, 50% of all crops attempted to be to, to grown, uh, grown by humans are lost to, uh, to disease. If you put that together with, with weed loss, you know, com competition to weeds and to uh, insect um, losses, all three of those together are getting somewhere in the order of, on the order of 40 or above 40% of all crop production. So these, these things that we battle in our home gardens are, are not limited to home gardeners. They're, they're a very serious global problem for feeding humankind. And, and then unfortunately for many of us who garden, garden organically or small scale, we don't have the resources that commercial farmers have, these losses can be much greater uh, because we are either unwilling to or can't afford to use chemical sprays, which whatever else we may think of them, they do boost production by killing insects very, very effectively and controlling diseases. So those options are not 
not even on the table here. I won't discuss those at all. Um, so what can we do again as organic gardeners or small scale backyard gardeners, community gardeners? I garden a little bit in my yard and a little bit in, um, in a community plot just down at the end of my street. What can we do about these things? Um, by the way, if you have, I see that the chat thing is, is, is lit up. I, I'm not gonna check at this moment, but um, uh, Tanya, if you can maybe alert me if there's some question that I can answer verbally, yeah. I'd be happy to be interrupted at any time. Okay. Um, don't have yeah. to wait till the end. All right, I'll be watching the chat for you. Okay. So um, a little bit of uh, anecdotal, not very scientific uh, experience of my own. Um, at one point, uh, back in the early 90s, when I was sort of new in the Boston area and was gardening a little bit in my home, in my uh, front and backyards, I had some sunny patches there. I used to set out for a household of two, I would set out about six or seven, eight tomato plants. And that was more than enough for a household of two. Um, at the end of the season, when frost was threatening, uh, going out to clean out the garden, we would have hundreds, literally hundreds of green cherry tomatoes on the ground. We have to rake them up and put them in the compost. They hadn't had time to ripen uh, before frost. At some point, and I was, I didn't know it then, but I was gardening in a sort of a disease-free honeymoon period. My little patch of ground hadn't had any vegetable gardening on it for a long, long time, or maybe never. And it was just, fan I thought I was like, man, I'm a great, I'm a genius gardener. <laughs> I'm getting so much out of this little tiny patch. And then one by one, the pathogens began to arrive. And uh, unfortunately, they're really good at, at staying where they are once they find you. They have ways of overwintering or coming back again next year. And once they arrive, it can be, it, it reduces your crop production very considerably. And again, kind of a back of the envelope kind of thing. Again, I used to plant around six, I'd set out about six tomato plants and we'd get plenty. And now I set out three times that many, right? Three to four times that many. And we get maybe something a little bit higher yield. I'm so paranoid that I'm not going to get any that I probably put out more plants than I need. But the yield reduction is very considerable. So something, certainly more than 50% of my individuals, this is just one case study, so it doesn't mean that much, but the losses can be really considerable. And if there's anything we can do about them, um, it's, it's worth finding out, I think. Now, again, as a, as a non-plant pathologist, uh, I like to attend talks by real plant pathologists and find out what they're thinking, the people who really know about this. And they always talk about this thing called the disease triangle. So after hearing the same talk about the disease triangle several times, I thought, well, I guess if I want to sound like a plant pathologist, or I, I should talk about the disease triangle as well. So here we go. Uh, this is a way of, of graphically representing and, and conceptualizing um, how plant diseases get established and, and damage your garden plants. There are basically three elements to this. To have the presence of disease, you have to have a pathogen present, a bacterium, a fungal organism, or a protist that's capable of causing disease. You have to have a host plant that is susceptible. So not all tomatoes will support the growth of certain strains of verticillium, fungus, and so forth. It has to be a, host, a susceptible host plant present. That's obvious. And then you have to have environmental factors that are favorable uh, for the growth of the pathogen. Okay. And if we have a disease problem in the garden, you can imagine the extent of that disease problem is more or less the area of this three-sided, this triangle, right? And if we can attack any one of those three areas on any face of that triangle, we can reduce the size of the triangle and, and therefore the, the severity of the disease that we're facing. And so we can do this in, in different ways. We can, if we, we take the, you know. Jim, can I interrupt with one question? Yes, you may, sure. Um, someone asked what a protist is, and I think that would be good too. And then later she also asked about squash stem borers, but maybe. Um, sure, uh, so a protist. Specific. Without getting into long details, the protists include things like algae and diatoms. Uh, we often think of protists as mostly things that float around in the ocean or in fresh water. And uh, that's pretty accurate most of it. It's a big kind of catch-all category in, in biology and taxonomy and classification in biology. It's kind of a big catch-all category that's traditional uh, where we threw in anything that we didn't know how else to classify. <laughs> so um, plants are pretty obvious. So they have roots and they have leaves and they photosynthesize and so forth. Fungi are pretty obvious. They have some, unite, some unifying characteristic. The protists do not. It's a very heterogeneous group and it happens to include some very serious plant pathogen. That's not a very good answer, but it's a, it's a big major group of organisms uh, to which some of the pathogens belong. Uh, the stem borers, I have a little trick for them. It, I don't consider that a disease, but I'll share my little trick. Um, uh, so my squash plants almost every year are attacked by a flying moth that lays its eggs at the base of my plants. 
and uh, the eggs hatch out and little larvae tunnel into the, to the, the interior of the stem and start to consume the tender cells, I guess, that line the inside of the hollow stems of your squash plants. And that causes, uh, once they feed to a certain extent, it causes wilting and the plant can die. And I've heard various remedies for this. Some people like to, they think that covering the lower stem of your plant with aluminum foil will block out the larvae. Haven't tried it. Uh, some people dust the, the lower part, the base of the plants with rotenone uh, to kill the eggs or the adults or something. I, I haven't tried that either. Uh, what I do is I get a sharp knife and I go out. When I see the plant exhibiting the first signs of wilt, you take the, uh, the knife and you slit the stem the long way, lengthwise, maybe about six inches, something like that, and carefully open it up. And you'll find big white grubs, borers in there. And you just remove them and destroy them and then leave the plant alone. And the plant will continue, will survive, amazingly, many of them. I do kill some, <laughs> so I, I, I plant about twice as many as I think I need, um, counting on 50% on dying on the, on the surgical table. But uh, enough survive to give me a pretty good crop. And um, that's a, it's an organic, simple way to, to take, and it's very effective. That's what I do. So back to our triangle real quickly. Um, we can do, as individual gardeners, we can take action to, uh, to reduce the environmental side of that triangle, uh, meaning we can set out our plants at times, at the appropriate time of year when the disease pressures are light, and that can allow us to get a good crop before the pressure becomes heavy later on in the season. Uh, some examples of that are cucumbers uh, that, uh, for me, uh, always, these years, always, for the past 10, 15 years have always succumbed to bacterial wilt every year, just a matter of trying to get them out there as fast as possible. So the, uh, the disease which arrives later still gives me time to get a crop. Um, you can extend the season, of course, with things like cold, cold frames and row covers to get an earlier start in that relatively disease-free early part of the season. Uh, watering is a, is a factor for some of these fungal diseases. They spread by airborne spores and to get established in your plants, the spores have to, have, they have to land on a wet leaf. Uh, if they land on a dry leaf, they really can't grow. So you can't stop the rain, of course, but when you're watering with your hose, watering at the base of the plants and avoiding wetting of the foliage can really help, um, maybe not stop entirely, but it can delay the onset of some of these uh, foliar diseases. We can work on the pathogen presence side of the triangle. Um, Garden sanitation, some of these diseases winter over in debris from the previous season. So disease leaves that are lying on the surface of your garden, instead of leaving them in the garden to compost in place, which, which is good for adding organic matter to your soil. Uh, if you bag them up and compost them separately, or uh, depending on the particular pathogen, you might want to actually dispose of some of that stuff if you've had a heavy disease here. And that will not eliminate, it won't take it to zero, but it certainly reduces the number of spores that you have to deal with next year, it may delay the onset and give you a longer uh, productive season. Another thing that I hate to say this, uh, because one of the chief pleasures in gardening often is to trade plants, you know, with other enthusiasts, um, but uh, given looking at the gardening world through my, through my present lens, uh, there is a real danger. Uh, some of these diseases live in soils and they're very long lived in soils up to 15 years. Uh, so I would, if I were, if I were, I'm not, if I were buying a new house someplace and establishing a, a backyard vegetable garden in a virgin site, I would not trade plants with anybody. Um, I would just try to delay the onset, the arrival of some of these diseases by avoiding that. I hate to say that, <laughs> so sorry about that. And then finally, we can um, try to reduce the host presence. Um, you know, uh, you could give up gardening. That would be the simplest way to do that. Well, we don't want to do that. So instead, um, and this will be a major recommendation I'll make several times um, this afternoon. For many of these diseases, there are very effective, highly resistant, naturally resistant varieties. And all you have to do is plant, plant those as opposed to the old fat, older, uh, susceptible varieties that can be really effective at reducing the, um, the severity of disease in your gardens. So uh, with that brief introduction, we're going to go through kind of a, um, a short list of, uh, again, these are the diseases that I have mostly personally dealt with. If your favorite disease isn't on the list, it's just because it isn't in my garden yet. Maybe next year, come back next year, maybe it will be. And so one at a time, I'll try to give you some idea of uh, what the symptoms are, what the severity is, how, how big a problem is this, uh, is there anything we can do uh, to control? And again, there'll be some good news, some, some bad news as we go through the list. So starting with uh, good news, uh, powdery mildew, this one is pretty easy to diagnose. Uh, I doubt that you've been, if you've been gardening for any time at all, I, I doubt that you haven't seen squash and cucumber plants later on the season covered first with these little 
uh, flowery looking white spots that can spread uh, to become more like in the, in the lower right corner uh, where they can cover the entire leaf surface down here. This is a fungal pathogen um, and it, uh, or it's a fungus like organism. And it is, um, fortunately there are very sprays that you can do. I've heard some homemade recipes uh, from people I trust. Um, I have not tried any of these, but people I trust have told me that the milk works pretty well. Some sort of dilution of milk in water spraying on the leaves will reduce the, um, uh, the presence of powdery mildews. Baking soda is also said to work. Again, I haven't uh, tried either one, so I can't uh, recommend either one from personal experience. But what I can strongly recommend is just a very simple, the simplest of all, just be sure you pick out uh, varieties of your squash and cucumbers that are naturally resistant. Uh, this is a, a shot from a field experiment of resistance in pumpkins, I guess it is, pumpkins and squash uh, in New York State. And the healthy looking vines are grown on the vines, not on trellises like we, we might do, but um, uh, the healthy looking plants in the rear are uh, the resistant variety, the ones in the foreground, many of which are dead at this point in the season, are the uh, susceptible variety. So it can make a very large difference in your productivity. Um, for years, I just sort of thought, well, this is for farmers. Well, I don't think I need this, or I don't even know what diseases I have. But now that I'm growing the uh, powdery mildew resistant varieties of mostly cucurbits, squash and, and uh, cucumbers, very effective. It really works well. All you need to do is pick out the right, the right variety. It's also especially important. I also recommend it if you, um, if you grow fall peas. Um, I used to try to grow fall crops of peas and they in, invariably were weak and didn't give me very much. And that's because one of the big reasons was I wasn't growing powdery mildew resistant peas. Uh, by fall, there's a lot of disease pressure, a lot of spores in the air that are not present in the spring. So in the spring, you can grow pretty much any variety of pea and it'll be productive. But by the fall, uh, it really helps to grow, to pick out a mildew resistant pea. Works very well, so I highly recommend this. I, I, I talk up my community gardeners, my fellow community gardeners every year about this and, and they persist, many of them persist in just pl planting whatever comes from Home Depot or <laughs> whatever. And I always brag at the end of the season, look at my plants over there, see those, how green they are? And yours are dying. <clears throat> um, some people, yes, so let me just, I'll, yeah. uh, some people think that um, uh, death from powdery mildew is actually a blessing. Once you've had your fill of zucchini, you haven't, you can't give any more away. It's actually okay to let them die off. But if you want them to survive, this really helps. So is there a question? Um, yeah, just could you give some advice for how to pick a resistant variety? So um, I believe it's, I looked into this question uh, six months or so ago, and I believe the answer was that for cucurbits, so anything in the squash family, squashes, pumpkins, uh, gourds, uh, melons, cucumbers, and so forth, I believe the source of resistance uh, within those crops is the same. And typically what, uh, where this, um, I should also interject here that um, when I talk with non-science people, um, wouldn't expect you to know this, but many uh, non-scientists are sometimes confused about what I mean when I talk about natural resistance. Uh, I used to use the term genetically resistant, and people would back away from me thinking I'm talking about GMOs or genetically uh, engineered organisms. I'm not talking about that. These, these plants are resistant because somebody out somewhere found a wild cucumber or in some cases a wild tomato. They tested those in the field and found that this particular variety, this wild genotype, if I can use that word of tomato, was resistant to a particular disease. And then they used that in breeding. They crossed it with commercial varieties and they transferred the resistance trait into the commercial varieties totally naturally, just by doing what bees would do, except you do it with a paintbrush. Okay, so it's just controlled crossing. And so um, if you, uh, this is something that's easiest to do if you uh, start your plants from seed. So seed catalogs online, um, some companies are better than others, but many of them are very, very clear about the resistance uh, that's possessed by the different varieties that they sell. Um, if you buy, if you're buying transplants from a, a garden center, it may be a little harder to determine uh, whether that variety that looks so nice in the little in the, in the flat is resistant to powdery mildew or whatever. So you might at, you could inquire at the garden center what variety is this? Uh, do you know anything about its disease resistance? Uh, you could on your phone, you could look up the company, um, look up, you know, Google the variety and see who made it, uh, see what uh, online companies carry it. And the online companies will often list the uh, disease resistance. So a little bit of research will usually reveal that. I hope that helps a little. Um, so uh, not 
particularly recommending these. These just happen to be a couple. This is one summer squash variety and, and a, a winter uh, butternut type squash that I've grown personally. And the resistance is very impressive. Uh, my plants, again, stay green and unblemished. It, the resistance is not 100%. Uh, they eventually uh, will get uh, powdery mildew, but it's much, much delayed. So I get a much longer season than my, my fellow gardeners who don't uh, pay attention to this. Oh, and here, here's another tip. <laughs> again, there's a, a great website uh, put up by Cornell that uh, includes lists of known resistant varieties for, for several different garden crops. So you can explore around that site and see if there are any that you know or any that appeal to you. Uh, downy mildew, it sounds similar. We also use the word mildew. This is a completely different organism. Uh, this is an example of a disease called, uh, caused by a protist. Uh, for a long time, we classified the organism as a fungus because it behaves a lot like a fungus, uh, but it's technically not, it's a, it's a protist. And um, in my garden, this is much less of a problem. This is something for powdery mildew, uh, the one we looked at previously. We think it might have a little bit of ability to survive our, fro our freezing winter temperatures up here in New England, but not very good ability. So there might be a little bit of the disease that survives locally, but mostly it comes north from warmer climates down south. So depending on weather patterns, um, again, that's, that explains why we see much more of it later in the season. Uh, the same is true of downy mildew. Uh, the big difference being that uh, you cannot, there's no spray uh, that can eliminate downy mildews once they're established in the plant. The only thing you can do as a grower is to proactively spray. If you're a chemical using farmer, you can proactively spray and stop the establishment before it gets started. If you're an organic gardener, I think there are some um, organically approved uh, fungicides, copper fungicides and so forth that can work on downy mildews. Uh, but you'd have to do these in advance of the arrival of, of the spores. Once they're in your plant, you can't cure a plant that's already been infected. Uh, the symptoms are as shown, it starts out in a, this looks like a cucumber leaf or I can't see my, Zoom controls are blocking it. Squash, okay, this is a squash leaf. And you'll see these little yellowing areas and notice that they're angular. Um, the cells in, that are enclosed in those major veins are uh, dying off or being affected. And, and the, the organism, the disease organism isn't very good at crossing those veins. So restricted by vein, pat, that pattern of being restricted by veins is characteristic of the downy mildews. And uh, this can advance. This plant is not very badly infected yet, but later on, on, on the underside of the leaf, uh, they produce spores that are typically kind of blackish, dark brownish, or purplish even. And note, again, note the angular, note how the infection is, is um, uh, restricted uh, by the larger veins of the leaf. Later on, uh, as it spreads, uh, it can be quite devastating to the crops, uh, kind of burning, appearing to burn them. And they can eventually succumb, can die from, the, uh, uh, from a, a bad infection. Um, now, uh, there's for commercial growers, there's, this is a serious enough disease, again, because you can't cure it once, it's, once it begins, uh, that commercial growers follow this. Uh, there's a tracking system. Again, I don't know what the date on this is. Um, this is from a couple of years ago. I didn't update this, but this is early in the season. I can't see the date on here, but you'll note that the disease is already present down here in southern Florida. And as uh, the season advances, you, it's kind of interesting, even if it doesn't help you with your gardening, it's interesting to watch this disease move northward uh, with weather. And eventually it often arrives in New England. Okay. And commercial growers will do this because they want to be ahead of the schedule and start spraying before the, uh, before the uh, disease arrives. If you're not in that category, you're looking for some home remedy for this. Um, once upon a time, we had good resistant varieties for downy mildews and cucumbers and so forth. Uh, but in about 15 years ago, a new strain uh, of the disease, uh, this is kind of like COVID, you know, mutations alter the genotype of, of the pathogen and now it's more infectious. And that happened with uh, cucumber uh, downy mildew. And so the resistant varieties are still better than non-resistant varieties, but they're not at the, the resistance is not as strong as it used to be against this new strain. So until the breeders get to work and conquer that new problem, we're a little bit limited. Uh, it still pays to grow the uh, listed um, resisted uh, varieties, but it's not as good as it was. Uh, one thing you can do, I, I mentioned earlier, I think one thing you can try to do with cucumbers is to get a jump on the season by early planting. So if you have cold frames or row covers or things you can set up to try to give a microclimate that will support early growth in these plants, often you can get something of a crop before the disease arrives. Because you, again, you have that waiting period. Sometimes it doesn't arrive till late summer. 
some summers in my garden, it doesn't arrive at all. Uh, so it's kind of a gamble, uh, but getting started early is, um, is likely to give you at least a longer season, uh, many years than, than, than doing nothing. Okay, um, let's see. Another downy mildew. This is another uh, recent, relatively recent development in uh, New England gardening. Probably most of you have seen this by now. Um, this is a, again, a similar organism. It belongs to the same category of downy mildews. Um, it's like the cucurbit downy mildew in that once your basal plants are infected, you can't cure them. The only thing you can do is be proactive. If you're willing to spray, you could spray with the fungicides uh, that are registered for that use. In advance, if you're an organic gardener, there's not much you can do at all um, other than hope that the disease arrives late in the season. It's another thing that comes up from Florida or, or whatever. And uh, the symptoms are, can be confusing. Um, the early symptoms, as you see over here, just looks like a malnourished plant. You might look at that and think, leaves are yellow. I need to give it a little more nitrogen or some fertilizer. Uh, I'll try that. And if you try that and it doesn't cure, <laughs> doesn't cure the, the symptoms, you very well likely, you very likely have a downy mildew. If you turn the leaves over, uh, you'll see these, again, these spore producing structures, uh, the little spore cases are kind of brown or black or purplish, dark, and they don't rinse off, right? It's not splashed. It may appear like a, that it's soil that's splashed up from the surface uh, during watering, but it doesn't rinse off. It's kind of attached to the plant. Then you probably have the downy mildew. Here's what it looks like under the microscope. Here's the little brown uh, spore case there. My, one of my students took that beautiful photograph um, several years ago. Anyway, this is a recently, this, this disease was unknown in the United States prior to about I don't know, 2007, something like that. But it, now that it's here, it's, it's, uh, it's firmly established in Southern Florida and it moves northward with weather patterns every season. Uh, alarmingly, they now have a tracking system for it. Um, uh, where is that? Here it is. They have a tracking system similar to the cucurbit downy mildew. And uh, last season, alarmingly, we had a, a major outbreak on Cape Cod very early in June. Uh, often in my garden, it doesn't arrive till August or September. Uh, but that indicates that some of it is probably, at least that, that suggests to me that probably some of it is moving north through it on uh, transplants that were grown in a southern state and shipped up here to home gardeners, or possibly on supermarket uh, basil that was grown in, in a place where the uh, disease was already present. So we can watch it coming. What can we do about it? There used to be no good news. Um, I let this slide in because it's kind of a joke. Uh, there was an Israeli uh, research team several years ago that uh, discovered that you can cure downy mildew from basil by heating it up really hot in a greenhouse for three days. So they heated the greenhouse, they closed it up. The greenhouse effect caused temperatures inside to reach 135 degrees for three days. Amazingly, the plants didn't seem to care about that. And you see that before and after the diseased plants before are on the left and then the heat cured ones are on the right. So I thought, well, can we do that as home gardeners? I thought, well, maybe if you grow your basil in pots, you can put it in your car, which in full sun will reach 140 degrees. Maybe this could be a solution for some of us. Fortunately, uh, we don't need to worry about that anymore because the breeders have gone to work. And I'm pleased to report that after several false starts, varieties that were supposedly resistant, but really weren't, not in my, not in my hands. Now we have some really highly naturally resistant varieties that breeders have created, again, just by crossing the appropriate varieties of basil with each other. And a couple that I've tried personally that work very well are the one, these two here, Prospera, uh, which was uh, produced by an Israeli uh, breeding uh, company. And then uh, Rutgers University in, in um, New Jersey uh, put together a series of uh, 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 varieties of basil that are very, very resistant. I, I've tested these in my gardens for two seasons now. And quite carefully, I'd get down on my hands and knees with the lens, looking, scrutinizing every surface of the leaf, looking for spores, never found any, not a single sign of any sporulation, any infection whatsoever, completely clean. Um, and uh, if you don't think that was a sacrifice, try and get it down on your hands and knees and looking at every leaf, uh, every leaf with a hand lens. Next time I do this, I'm gonna do it on a bench. Anyway, I highly um, recommend Jim. these. Yes. 
Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, so my personal question about that is, did you get your hands on these basil varieties? Like, did you grow those from seed or are those I, being sold? Yeah. Okay, I yeah. grew them from seed. I suspect I'll be interested to see this semester, uh, this uh, this year. I didn't really, you know, last year I was afraid to go to the garden center much, so I didn't. I kind of stayed holed up at home. Yeah. But this year uh, I'll be braver about getting out. I'll be interested to see whether uh, garden centers are starting to grow these because it's, it's certainly made waves among the uh, people who pay attention to diseases and, and gardening <laughs> yeah. and breeding. So I think these are going to become, become uh, more common and easily obtainable, but we'll see. And there's, um, there's a question in the chat. Can you talk about whether F1 hybrids are more likely to be disease resistant? I think that's related to what you were. Uh, they are. Part. We'll touch on that as we go. So, um, so these okay. plants, um, when we get to tomatoes, so many of you probably grow some hybrid tomatoes and so forth. Many of those hybrid tomatoes are, um, they are bred specifically so they have certain disease resistances that would not be present in some of the heirloom varieties. Um, I think, I'm, why don't I leave that, I'll answer that in fits and starts as we go. But the general answer is yes, because one of the breeding objectives in making an F1 hybrid is often to uh, include some disease resistance along with other, with other characters. Um, what was I gonna say? These, um, these basils I've heard to me, um, they taste fine. We just have used these. I grew some regular old fashioned susceptible basil alongside as the control and they were devastated by the, uh, the mildew. Whereas these just sailed through unblemished and we just used them without any, uh, we used all of them the same and they all seemed fine. I didn't particularly notice any difference. I've heard people say that they don't think the flavor is quite as good. Uh, maybe my palate is not very discriminating. So if you try these and, and you have an opinion one way or the other, I'd, be, I'd like to hear from you. There's our tracking system. Okay, now here's a disease. This one uh, bedevils my garden um, every year now. It wasn't always the case. I don't know exactly what's happened, why this disease is now present, but wasn't in the past. But every year now I set out uh, cucumber vines uh, with great enthusiasm and they grow vigorously and they start to climb their structure. And in a bad year, just, as, just about as soon as they start to flower, I see the emergence of these little cute little yellow beetles here, oops, here right, that are, that feed on, on the, the leaves and they can cause some feeding damage, but usually it's not, in my garden, I don't have enough of these beetles to, to worry about the, the direct feeding damage, but they can carry a bacterium that causes bacterial wilt. And the first uh, sign is a wilted leaf like that, and then pretty soon it spreads to another leaf and pretty soon the whole vine uh, wilts and dies. And this is another thing that's it's incurable. There's no way to get inside the plant um, and eliminate the bacteria. They, they grow within the vasculature, the water conducting tissue, and they clog it up and cause the wilting and eventually the death of the plant. Uh, so there's no way to cure an infected plant. The, uh, the solution to this, if there is one, is to try to control the beetles because they're the, they're the vectors that bring the bacterium with them. Here's a diagnostic if your, if your cucumbers are wilting and you wanna know for sure whether it is or is not bacterial wilt, you need to get a piece of a stem or a petiole, a, a leaf stalk can sometimes work as well. And a very, very sharp blade, a razor blade is probably best. You need a very clean cut, slice that stem. And against a nice dark background, you have to play around with the lighting a little bit. But when you, you stick those stems sections together and pull them apart very slowly, you'll see these little mucilaginous strands of sticky stuff. And that's, that's sticky stuff that's, uh, that's elaborated by the, uh, the bacteria inside the plant. That's a pretty firm, clear diagnostic that you have the bacterial wilt. So what we need to do is um, there are some varieties that are advertised as being uh, resistant to bacterial wilt. I've tried them. <laughs> they aren't. I don't see much difference at all, maybe a little. Um, so again, the key, if there is one, is to try to do something to reduce the populations, the beetles that are carrying it. How do you do that? Here's one that I haven't tried. Um, uh, there's a, a clay uh, preparation. It's very finely ground play. I'd be, uh, clay. I'd be interested in, in trying it sometime. I just haven't ever gotten around to it. Um, I'm a little bit of a lazy gardener. This is something you'd have to spray on um, the plants repeatedly. Every rain is going to wash off and you'd have to put it back on. That's a little bit much for my schedule, I guess. I'd be interested in, in trying it just to see whether it works, but it forms a thin barrier on surfaces of the plant. And apparently that's a repellent. It's uh, unpleasant to the, uh, the beetles and they'll go off and find some other plants. Might work, might not work. Um, some, another solution that has some evidence behind it uh, is to use row covers or exclusion to exclude the, the beetles. 
this is uh, not my garden. This is uh, some farmer's field in Iowa or someplace. And they've covered this row of squash or some sort of cucurbit melons, maybe something under there with a row cover. And that blocks out, if you do that satisfactorily, you um, tuck down all the edges so there's no openings. Uh, that, that can really exclude the beetles. The problem is that many cucurbits need to be, they're insect pollinated. They have to have bees or access to um, pollinators. And if you keep the row cover on for the entire season, you may have a beetle free, but fruit free crop as well. So one solution to that is to um, remove the grow covers after the early season. Once the, the, plow, the flowers, the plant starts to flower and eat the pollinators, you remove the covers to allow access by the pollinators. Um, I tried uh, growing a, another solution I thought would be the perfect solution would be to grow a so-called parthenocarpic uh, cucumbers. I've done this with cucumbers, not with melons. Uh, so my experience is only with cucumbers. Um, these are cucumber varieties that don't need pollination. The flowers will just form fruits without any pollinators present. I thought that will be perfect. Uh, for, for some reason, maybe I was sent the wrong seeds. <laughs> I don't know what, they didn't self-pollinate or they didn't, they didn't produce fruits uh, parthenocarpically. So I had to start opening up my little structure, which I'll show you here. This is my version, my ragtag version of this. I went down to the fabric store and got some nylon tool like we'd use to make little kids tutus or something and kind of cobbled together the structure. It's very good at excluding the beetles. I, I never found a single beetle inside, but I wasn't getting any cucumber. So I had to take this thing all apart hand pollinate the flowers and then, you know, set it back up again. And that was fun for the first few days. And after that, I began to really appreciate what bees are doing for us. They're very useful critters. Uh, so uh, I don't know why this didn't work. It seems like it could. So you're, again, you're free to experiment with this. I think it seems like it ought to work. Another thing that I've tried and seems like it should work, but I have so far uh, had no success with is uh, using traps and lures. Um, this is from, shown here is a big yellow jug of something that uh, this is a model trap put out by, I think it was the University of Missouri Extension. Uh, one of the Midwestern states did this study. And inside that jug is a chemical lure uh, that puts out compounds that are attractive to cucumber beetles. Cucumber beetles smell these things and think, oh, there's some cucumber plants down there. I'm gonna head down and chew and lay some eggs. And inside is also uh, either, you can either put insecticide directly inside the jug. My version is over here. It's just a jar uh, with a, a yellow sticky card and a lure. So it has the chemical attractant, but doesn't have any poison in it. And these little, I don't know if you can see it, we were, the instructions say to bore these holes exactly the right size so that they're just big enough for a beetle to climb in, but not a, not a, not a honeybee. You don't want to heal the, the bees. And at the end of the season, I thought this is going to solve my problems. At the end of the season, I had trapped three or four bees and not a single cucumber beetle. So I don't know what went wrong there either. Again, it's an idea that sounds good, but uh, to date, it hasn't worked effectively for me. Feel free to try it. If you have success with this, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to come out and see your installation, in fact. <laughs> so let me know. All right. Um, this, is a, this is a disease that I didn't have until relatively recently. It seemed to have uh, arrived in our community garden and uh, to add insult to injury, it arrived in my plot first. <laughs> so one year, I used to consider kale and things like collards and so forth, the, one of the easiest things to grow. You just stick them in the ground, they sort of take care of themselves. And uh, one year, my little collards transplants just stood still while everybody else's grew big and beautiful and luxuriant. Mine were tiny after months in the ground. And when I pulled them up at the end of the season, here's what I saw, something like that. They are, have been affected by an organism that causes club root. It survives in the soil and it invades the roots of susceptible plants and forms these clubby uh, structures. And here's what they look like under the microscope. This is my definitive diagnosis. These cells are filled with club root spores that when the plant dies, they go off into the soil and look for other plants to infect. This is another one of these things that once it gets into the soil, it's very, very hard to get rid of it. They're long lived in the soils. If you, were, if you have a huge farm and you're able to rotate, if you could rotate away from that location for many years, you could probably eliminate it that way. But in my community garden, you know, 15 feet square, I have a pretty good sized plot. Uh, there's no way to rotate effectively. It doesn't make any, uh, not, not big enough to do that. Anyway, so what can we do these, about this? Uh, if you're grow, gardening in the same spot every year, there are some uh, supposedly resistant varieties and I've tried them. I've tried this one in particular. Um, you can find some of those varieties listed on that, that Cornell site that I showed you earlier. 
Um, and I guess they were resistant, but I had, uh, again, it's hard to do controlled experiments in gardens. Um, I planted this variety, they were growing pretty well for a while. And then I had major problems with uh, cabbage loopers or maybe the diamondback moth or something was eating huge holes, skeletalizing the leaves. So even if it was controlling the, the club root, it didn't, <laughs> didn't matter. So I didn't really, I couldn't really tell. Uh, how effective that resistance uh, was. So again, a, an incomplete, inconclusive experiment on my part. Another thing that I have read about and decided I would try is that uh, the club root is susceptible, you can inhibit the club root and its ability to infect your plants by controlling the soil pH if it's uh, on the alkaline end of neutral, 7.2 or a little bit higher. Uh, and you can achieve that by liming to the correct degree. If you, live, uh, if you lime with hydrated lime, which is uh, different from standard garden lime, it's even more effective. Um, and supposedly keeping your soil at that pH inhibits the ability of club root to infect your plant. So I just, I tried this out on a tiny little square in my community plot, um, you know, limed it with, uh, with calcium hydroxide and then tested the pH and got it in the target level. And here are the not very scientific results. Oh, I had also read somewhere, I thought that, uh, Red kale, red Russian kale, which is a variety I already like, um, is more resistant to club root than standard kale. They're different species. They're in the same family, but they're not, they're botanically, they're different species. And I thought I read that somewhere. I've never been able to locate <laughs> where it was that I saw that. So I, I might've made it up. But in any case, I've been growing red kale uh, ever since I discovered club root in the garden. Here's my experiment. So I grew this Russian kale and then I grew the supposedly resistant Chinese cabbage and I grew them both limed and unlimed. So it's a kind of a four way experiment. And uh, you can see these bigger, the bigger divisions like this, this is a plant cell and these little tiny things there, those are the spores, okay, the club root spores. And so if we look, if we just compare the two columns, if we look at the kale, uh, which is not officially resistant, at least not as far as I can tell, as long as I can't find any official evidence of that. We compare that with the resistant Chinese cabbage. I think overall, you'll see more spores on the left-hand column than on the right, maybe kind of eyeballing it. And if we compare the lime with the not lime by comparing the rows, if we look on the top, the plants of either variety uh, that were not limed in general have more spores uh, present you know, in this not very scientific N equals one experiment uh, than the lime plants on the bottom. So my conclusions are very tentatively that the liming seems to help. And I think, <laughs> again, kind of anecdotally, it's not very scientific, uh, the red Russian kale for me in any way, at any rate seems to perform better than regular cabbage or regular kale, that kind of thing. So uh, again, let me know what you, uh, what you find. If you try either of these things, let me know what the results are, I'd like to know. Jim, would um, growing collards or other brassicas in a container help with this, do you think? Yes, absolutely. I, I've switched to doing some container was... gardening uh, to avoid some of these soil-borne pathogens. Uh, that's an easy solution. Um, Catherine, I don't mean to take credit for your suggestion. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, that that's was a comment great. in the chat. <laughs> oh, no, that's, yeah, that's great. Um, exactly. You came to the same conclusion I did, which is if, if these organisms are in my soil and I can't get rid of them for 15 years, let's get a big pot and put some, uh, some potting soil in. And that's been pretty effective. Um, and here's one that really gets me. I'm a tomato snob. I, I guess you would call me my favorite plant. My favorite garden plant is the tomato. Um, if I couldn't grow tomatoes, I don't know if I'd continue gardening or not. And I have a bunch of diseases that affect my tomato production. And these are the ones that I most detest and would like to control. There's only some good news here. So much of this news is going to be bad. Um, <clears throat> There are diseases, there's a category of diseases called vascular wilts, and these are caused by organisms, uh, disease organisms that can live in the soil in a dormant state, and they can wake up and invade susceptible plants like my tomatoes through the root system, and they move upward through the plants. They produce the, these thin little um, uh, filamentous growth, and these little balls on the end are little, uh, little droplet contains many, many little spores, little tiny things, and these are small enough to get inside the vasculature of your plants, they release the spores inside the plant, not in the air. One good thing here is these, these diseases do not spread, they're not airborne, they're soil borne. They release the spores inside the plant and they float up as the water moves up through the vascular toward the leaves and they colonize the entire plant very rapidly that way. And the simple, there's two of them, the other one, there are two uh, kinds of fungal organisms that do this. One is called verticillium, one's called fusarium. Their life cycles are fairly similar. Uh, their symptoms are fairly similar. Control, me uh, control measures are fairly similar. So I'm kind of lump them together and to talk about them as one. Um, 
The first symptoms that we often see is just sort of wilting of the leaves on a hot day. And that's because the, the, the vasculature, again, the water conducting tissue is clogged up with these fungi and you can't get enough water up to the upper leaves. In the early stages, they'll often recover overnight. So by the next morning, it'll look turgid and expanded again. They'll wilt during the day and go through that cycle. Eventually, they start to kill the plants and you'll see these kind of triangular river delta looking uh, areas on, on leaves where there's sort of a choke point here where presumably the vasculature is, is blocked off and everything downstream from that is beginning to die off. As it gets more severe, they'll, they'll kill off uh, large areas within a, within a vine like here or here. And if it's severe enough, if it's a good year for the pathogen and a bad year for your tomatoes, they can actually uh, nearly kill uh, your plants. They often don't kill them, but they certainly weaken them and, and reduce your, um, um, your, your yield. And unfortunately, this is another uh, pathogen that can survive for a long, long time in soils. Um, there are stories kind of anecdotal, but I, I believe them, in which uh, scientists have collections of pathogenic fungi and then they retire. And the drawer where they kept their collection was untouched for 15 years, but now the lab needs that space. So they're cut cleaning out the old drawer and the fungi in those old collections 15 years ago are still viable when you wet them, they can still infect plants. So that would mean to, to rotate again, to rotate away from this disease is not practical for um, vegetable gardeners or home gardeners or community gardeners. Um, so, uh, you know, this bothered me so much to discover that I had this, once I diagnosed this, I was surprised to find this in my own garden. I thought this was a kind of a commercial tomato farming problem in California. Well, I, I was wrong. Uh, I got curious to know whether uh, other gardeners in this area had the same problem or was I just particularly unlucky. So I did a little, a very little informal kind of small study uh, one summer, five years ago now, I guess six years ago going on um, and uh, found that everybody has these. All the community gardens I, I uh, visited had one or the other and sometimes multiple uh, versions of these vascular wilts. So what can, what can we do about these? There are some resistant varieties. In fact, there's a, uh, one of the oldest, uh, most successful uh, natural resistances in any garden plant is resistance to what we call race one verticillium. And if you grow tomatoes, hybrid tomatoes, here's our big beef and what's this one down here? can't see it. Oh, Parks Whopper. These are kind of standard um, uh, <clears throat> hybrid tomatoes for big slicer tomatoes. And uh, they will, uh, if they list the disease codes, this is for fusarium, uh, oops, vascular wilts right there. And this V means verticillium. Sometimes tomatoes are called VF, VFN tomatoes, verticillium, fusarium, and nematodes. That's kind of a disease resistance package that's on lots and lots of hybrid tomatoes. And um, if you have verse, race one verticillium in your soils, all you need to do is plant resistant varieties. It's very effective. It's a natural resistance that came from a wild tomato plant in Peru back in the 1930s. And it's been used in breeding systems, uh, breeding programs ever since to give that very effective resistance to your tomato plants. Unfortunately, uh, nowadays we have more than one race of verticillium. Race two can overcome that resistance. It doesn't work at all. My garden, of course, has race two. <laughs> so there's, this just doesn't help me. But you, if you think you might have verticillium wilt, you could always try uh, planting these plants. If it cures it up, that's probably what you had. Fusarium uh, comes in three different races. And if you check caref carefully, again, for home gardeners, you, you're not going to be able to diagnose what race or even what species you have. But it's worth trying these things just in case. Um, if you do have one of those things and you plant a resistant variety, the resistances are very effective when they're paired up with the right disease pathogen. So I recommend trying that. Um, and there's um, one question about whether nutritional deficiencies make plants susceptible to the wilt. They definitely do. And this is, this is kind of anecdotal. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. In my experience, that summer going around visiting all the different community gardens was really informative. I really enjoyed that. I got to meet a lot of gardeners and see all these different gardening techniques and chat with people. But it was also very interesting to see almost side by side. Some people fertilize their gardens very heavily, make sure that they have lots of amendments and fertility in the soil. And some figure, I'm just going to use whatever's there. And um, that is, I think, the most effective, easiest thing that we can do as individual gardeners is to make sure that your plants are getting plenty of fertilizer, whatever form you choose to do that in, plenty of nitrogen. And they will, despite the presence of these vascular wilts, they will grow their way away from them. I'll show you a picture that illustrates that uh, pretty clearly in just a moment. 
Uh, first, just a word on um, those of us who like to grow heirloom tomatoes. If, you're, if you don't want to grow F1 hybrids, they're too modern. <laughs> you're interested in the old fashioned flavor and so forth, which in, this includes me, I grow both. Um, unfortunately, none of the heirloom tomatoes, to my knowledge, have ever been tested for verticillium resistance, and it's, it's, it's doubtful that any of them have it, because all the resistance that we have came from this single accession of a wild Peruvian tomato back in the 1930s, and your heirloom tomatoes almost certainly do not have that. Uh, a complicated solution is to graft them. Uh, you can protect against uh, different strains, different races of fusarium, and against race one verticillium by grafting the top part of a, an heirloom tomato on the rootstock uh, from, that is resistant and doesn't allow the, uh, the vascular wilts to enter your plant. I don't know if any of you have, have played around with grafting tomatoes are becoming a little bit more popular now. It's, it's kind of fun to do, but it is, a, it is a production. It's not something that's simply done. Um, anyway, so this is a possible solution for some people who are either willing to do this themselves, and again, it's kind of fun, or increasingly you can buy, I see grafted tomato plants offered for sale. They're pretty expensive, in my opinion. And again, this will only work if the grafting rootstock is resistant to the particular strain of vascular wilt that's present in your garden. And since as home gardeners, you can't diagnose that, you'd have to send that off to, well, even if you sent that off to a plant pathology lab, they typically don't diagnose race. They'll just tell you it's verticillium. You're not gonna know whether that's race one or race two. So this is something to do. I, I would recommend trying this only if you were, there are some advantages to grafting aside from disease resistance. They're bigger, more abundant, hardier, more, more robust plants. So it's kind of fun to do for that reason. And it might um, also help you with your uh, vascular wilt problems if you have them. Um, you can also, eggplant I didn't mention are in the same family, the same big plant family as, um, as tomatoes, and they also can suffer from um, uh, vascular wilts. And you can also gra can graft them on the same tomato rootstocks that you can use for tomatoes. Um, I tried this uh, several years. Uh, the first year, I was very impressed by the vigor of my grafted eggplants. They were huge compared to the non-grafted plants, and I thought, <laughs> I'm a total convert to that. In other years, this just shows you the, the variability that we work with in uh, trying to do experimentation in, bio, in biology. Other years, they've been, the, the results, the differences have not been so, um, so apparent. So I'm not sure whether it worked or not from my personal experience. I'll try it again this year and let you, let you know next year if I got any good results. Um, <clears throat> this is something that came by um, a, a gardening friend, brought this to my attention a few years ago as a possible solution to uh, vascular wilt control. So I had to try it. Um, it's a natural, it's a bacterium that occurs naturally in soils and this company grows this bacterium in big tanks and dries it down to a powder that you can use. You can dissolve it in water and water, you can drench the soil with this stuff and supposedly it inhibits or blocks verticillium uh, from entering your plant roots. So I was skeptical of that, but I tried it and it didn't work for me. Um, <clears throat> My tomato plants, I'm sure, very quickly grew beyond the drenched area. <laughs> Once they're beyond the drenched area, this isn't going to do any good. It might work. I can't say that it doesn't work um, mechanistically. It might work in a, in a potted plant or something like that. But again, if you start with clean potting soil, it shouldn't be a problem anyway. Um, some other solutions that are more on the scale of what commercial farmers can do. I'll just throw these out there real quickly. <clears throat> There's a technique called biofumigation in which you grow plants that as they decompose, they produce compounds that are, are toxic to verticillium, for example, to vascular wilt pathogens. This is a field in California. <clears throat> uh, after they've harvested the broccoli, they chop up the, the remainder of the plant and till that into the soil and uh, broccoli is in the mustard family. And as it decomposes, it, it releases compounds that are inhibitory uh, to, uh, to verticillium. I don't know how practical, I've never tried this on a home gardener scale. I'm not sure how practical that is, but. Um, Food for thought, that's all that is. Another technique uh, that is used, I think mostly in hotter, sunnier places like Oklahoma, California, Israel, and so forth is to solarize your soil. And this involves, this is a, a beneficial harnessing of the so-called greenhouse effect. You roll clear plastic on your soil. The sun's rays pass uh, through the clear plastic and it traps a lot of the heat that's, and it blocks it from re-radiating re -radiating back out to the atmosphere or, or out to space. So it heats the soil. Um, I tried this just experimentally in little patches uh, for weed control and the temperature gets really hot under there. And you leave this on for uh, several weeks during the hot part of the summer and you cook the soil and that will kill off 
a lot of the resting structures of vascular wilts. It probably won't get them all because some are going to be too deep uh, to be reached by the heat, but it can cut down their numbers and uh, reduce the needs for any other kinds of control. Commercial farmers, of course, fumigate their soil with, with toxins. Uh, as home gardeners, I don't think any of us are probably interested in doing that. This is an organic sort of organic alternative that might work. Again, I think it's probably more practical in hotter, sunnier places. I'm not sure if this could be really possible in New England. And you lose the season's production because you need this plastic on there during much of the, uh, the hot part of the summer. The other thing that troubles me about this is you're using all this plastic. The plastic will degrade in ultraviolet light. You can only get one season out of it. So you're throwing away all this plastic. I don't know, food for thought. Uh, here we are. Here's the, the slide that uh, one of you asked about, uh, you know, soil fertility and its effects on, on plant health. Uh, so on the left, we have some scrawny little plants that the gardener, this is a, I think this might be at the Berkeley Street Garden, I can't remember now, in Chinatown, uh, on the edge of Chinatown. And uh, the plants on the left are kind of, you know, measly little things that didn't probably get a lot of added fertilizer. And I don't know if you can see very well, but there's a lot of leaf yellowing. That is almost certainly uh, verticillium, fusarium, or possibly both uh, that's badly affecting these little plants. In the same community garden, somebody else has abundantly fertilized their plants. They're green. There's a little bit of vascular wilt evidence down at the base, but it doesn't matter because the plant is growing so vigorously up top that it just doesn't really care. And so that's my, my principal recommendation, I guess, for uh, the vascular wilt problem is just to fertilize a lot <laughs> in whatever form you choose to put your fertilizer on. Uh, finally, getting toward the end, I think I'm probably running out of time. I don't want to run over, but um, there are some- You have about so the, 10 minutes. Okay, that's perfect. So the, um, these uh, vascular wilt pathogens, again, are soil borne. They, they get into the soil and they enter your plants from below. Uh, what we're now going to look at is a, uh, a, a group of mostly tomato diseases here that are foliar. They, they, uh, they spread around through airborne or splashed uh, spores that land on the leaf surfaces and start to grow. They form little brown dead spots. And if there are enough of those spots, if they're close enough together, they can uh, really restrict photosynthesis, uh, reduce the health of your plant, reduce the yields and so forth. Um, there are three different ones that are pretty important to New England. Uh, one is called Septoria, early blight. These are very similar and their control measures are identical. So I'm gonna lump them together. And the, and the other one is late blight. This is a much more serious one, harder to control, harder to do anything about it as a home gardener, except hope that it doesn't come this year. Uh, so let's take those first two foliar diseases uh, together. Septoria looks like this, it forms little sort of sunken spots uh, on the leaves and characteristic of septoria are little uh, sort of freckles, little raised bumps, little tiny things uh, within that generally brown spot. Those little bumps are where the, the pathogen, it's a fungus, is making its spores. If you take a leaf here and you slice it, take a very, very thin slice sideways through one of those little bumped raised areas, these are these linear things are the spores under a microscope, okay? Um, here's a, these are my terrible photographs. A real plant pathologist authorized me to use her much better photographs. Um, and you can see very clearly these little uh, black raised areas within that general area of leaf necrosis or death. And that is characteristic of septoria again. Um, early blight, similar in its, in its life cycle and so forth, but the spots that it produces have this sort of bullseye, sort of concentric rings um, that are uh, characteristic of their spots. And not that it makes much difference if you know which is which, because again, their life cycles are very similar. They produce spores. They can get into the soil uh, from dying plants from the previous season. They can survive in the soil at least one year, at least one winter, and probably several. And in the following season, uh, rains will splash those dormant spores onto the lower leaves of your plants. They'll start to grow. They'll form these little spots and then we'll sporulate again. The next rain will splash them a little bit higher. They can also uh, spread uh, through the air in, in dry weather. They do need a, a wet leaf surface uh, to begin to grow. And so in seasons where we don't get a lot of rain, last season we had quite a lot long dry spell in the summer. And those are bad seasons for these foliar diseases. They're great seasons for tomatoes. Um, uh, simply because uh, they need a wet leaf surface to, uh, to get established. So here's where, um, if you're watering your plants, if the rain is not producing enough water, if you're out there with a hose watering, um, just adopting a watering pattern that waters the plant at the base, believe it or not, something as simple as that can really make a difference in probably not stopping forever, but certainly delaying uh, the start and the, the progress of this disease. 
here's what they look like again when the leaves are badly affected um, the overall plant production um, drops and uh, in, in a really bad year really damp wet year they can come pretty close to killing the plant here's an illustration of uh, again the principle of uh, avoiding wetting the leaves uh, they've these researchers have put down a um, uh, sort of a sheet uh, plastic mulch of some sort uh, soil cover and that's preventing splashing of rainwater from bringing spores up to the lower leaves. And some of them they put a little tents over these plants so they're pre preventing rainwater from hitting the leaves at all and when you do that you can get these beautiful healthy plants <laughs> that are untouched by these foliar diseases because the spores can never get started. There are some natural re naturally resistant uh, varieties uh, supposedly. Um, for whatever reason, in my garden, we've had fairly dry summers for the last several years, and I, I've wanted to test these resistances, but I haven't, it has been such a poor year for the pathogens that I, I don't have a strong impression of, of whether and of, of the effectiveness of, of these resistances, but there are many out there. So you can, you can look at these again and, and select. If you think you have this problem, it's not hard to find some uh, varieties that are supposedly resistant. Uh, some of these tomatoes are pretty good. Jasper is a pretty good variety, independently of, of whether the, the disease resistance actually works. Uh, they're little tangy cherry tomatoes. They're very small, but they're very flavor flavorful. So I think they're worth growing and they might be resistant to septoria. Um, this slide, I guess this slide's been in here about three years now. This is a, I'll, I'll tell you about it anyway. Um, Iron Lady was a um, multi-disease resistant variety. It was developed at Cornell University in New York State. And when this came out, it has supposedly has resistance both to septoria and early blight. So one package that would resist both of those, um, those foliar diseases and uh, late blight, which we haven't got to, and uh, some of the vascular wills. So this is, to my knowledge, the biggest, most extensive disease resistance package in any known uh, variety of tomato. So I signed up to be the first to receive these and grew, I've grown them for several seasons. But again, they've been fairly dry years and I haven't had a chance to really get much of an impression of whether the uh, foliar disease resistance is worth anything. So I, I can't really tell you. I, I've been very unimpressed by the flavor. <laughs> to me, they taste like kind of a flavorless commercial tomato. You might have a different opinion. So it's worth trying if you'd like to do this, but I, um, I don't consider these worth growing just for that reason. Um, there are some alternatives. Uh, after Iron Lady, there was another company that uh, put out two varieties. One of them is called Brandywise, in case anybody would like to explore this. I think that's the cult of our name. And it's a similar, uh, it's a similar variety of tomato, which again, put together at Cornell, uh, but they explicitly cross, they, did, they made the cross. These are hybrid tomatoes. They made the cross between Brandywine and the experimental, the, 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 uh, uh, the academic, the, um, uh, the tomato carrying all the res resistance genes uh, in, in an attempt to be sure that they got the good flavor. Uh, they didn't really impress me either, <laughs> but maybe I'll try them again. But um, so far, I didn't think they were the equal. They certainly were not the equal of real brandy wine. And then finally, just to finish up, this is the disease that is really devastating in bad years. Uh, there was one year back in maybe 2008 or nine or something when this was really widespread in New England. We generally see some of it every year now. It's become uh, kind of an annual event. In my, it doesn't reach everywhere though, because in my garden it has never returned uh, since whatever year that was. I'm waiting, I'm sure it will be back. Uh, this is a um, this is a protist. Somebody who asked about protist is a disease caused by a protist, and it is the same pathogen that caused widespread starvation uh, during the Irish potato famine uh, in the uh, 1840s. So it infects both tomatoes and tomatoes. It's very rapid spreading. Once it gets onto your plant, it will kill that plant often within a matter of days, and then it, it produces abundant spores that go on to infect many other plants around you and in, in, in the region. It's I, the advice that all real plant pathog pathologists will tell you is that if you find this on your plants, you have a, a moral and ethical duty to destroy those plants rapidly. You don't put them on your compost pile, you bag them up and destroy them so that they're incapable of spreading of spores. And you do this because that sacrifice will prevent or at least delay, possibly prevent uh, the spreading of this disease to others and possibly prevent a regional outbreak. The problem with that for home gardeners is we can't really off necessarily distinguish this from lots of other diseases. Here are the, the distinguishing features. If you wanna try this <clears throat> within a very short period of time, they'll produce these little white 
spore producing structures on either the upper leaf surface often or on the stems. So if you see something that looks like that, even if you're not sure, um, you know, by the time you collect a sample and send it to the state plant pathologist, it'll be too late. Uh, you might want to just destroy this plant just in case this is the late blight, you might be preventing a statewide outbreak. <laughs> okay. Um, again, <clears throat> it's, uh, they spread very, very rapidly. It's uh, incurable. Once a plant is infected, there's no possible way for anybody, not even a commercial farmer who is using chemical sprays to cure it. It's just a matter of time and that time is very short. Uh, one other thing that we can do as home gardeners is to try to, if we've had uh, late blight in our area in a previous season, if we're potato growers, these organisms, the, the pathogen can only survive, can't, doesn't produce dormant spores that survive winter in the soil. It can only survive in living tissue. And in New England, that means potatoes that were grown from an infected plant the previous season. So one of the things, one of the little things we can do is for potato growers, if you have volunteers from little tubers that you didn't find when you dug up your potato plants last year, your tubers last year, uh, don't let those grow this season just in case they're carrying a late blight um, disease from the previous season. That's the one little thing we can help with. So Jim, okay. just to let you know, um, like one or two minutes left, and then they told me to be strict with the end time. So. All right, I, I will abide by that. Okay. We're just about to the end. Um, just um, There are some <clears throat> tomato varieties that are listed for late bite resistance. Again, we haven't had it, uh, I'm not complaining, we haven't had it in my garden for a bunch of years, so I don't know whether it works or not. Every year I plant, um, I plant this one jasper just in case I think this could be the year I want to find out whether this, this resistance actually works. So I always plant some, but I have not had an opportunity to uh, evaluate that myself. Uh, so again, if you're if you fear this or if you want to have a you know, kind of a, a hedge, hedge your bets and be ready in case this arrives, you can plant one of these uh, resistant varieties. And that's it. Um, here's kind of a, a summary slide. You can read it, I guess. <laughs> I guess the, uh, the central rec my central recommendations for what people can practically do as home gardeners is to um, investigate resistant varieties uh, where they're available. That's the simplest possible thing you can do. Certain garden sanitation measures can help um, not eliminate, but reduce um, the burden, the disease pressure on your plants in following seasons. Um, those are the simplest things to do. If you try something, um, that we've spoken of here today, or if you come up with a, a different idea that you try, if, if, if something seems to work for me, I, I'd really appreciate hearing from you later on. You can get my email uh, through the trustees. Uh, I'd like to know what you do. Um, I guess with that, we can take questions. Oh, some resources for you. Here's this, um, this is a Cornell University site. They're upgrading this site and kind of moving a lot of the content to another one, but you can still link to it all through this. Uh, I use this all the time. If you're an amateur plant pathologist and you want to uh, get a little more, more specific with your diagnoses. This is a great place to find photographs of disease symptoms and so forth. A lot of the articles on the site are old. They're from the 1980s and so forth. But the basic life cycles of these pathogens are just the same as they were in the 80s. Hasn't changed. So a lot of good for information there. Uh, this is a, a national organization devoted to plant pathology. And they have a, a section on their website devoted to uh, little articles on the basic biology of, of some of the, the important plant pathogens. Okay. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I learned a lot from that. And also a recommendation to people taking notes in my classes these days. You can just take a photo and maybe get some of those websites down. Um, and I just wanted to mention that there are some links I posted in the chat about things that the trustees um, wants to inform people about, such as a survey for a chance to win a gift card, um, and signing up for their Gardener's Gazette and other programs. So please take a look in the chat and thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. I believe this link is being used for another chat, so I don't. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so, Tanya, where do you um, garden? Recording. Yeah, it's stopped.
morning. Okay.